Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is my evolving research program on urban agriculture, working with diverse communities. Um, as part of my PhD research, um, which occurred from 2010 to 2014 in Chicago, and more recently here at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I've been here at URI for two years, and I don't consider myself to be an expert like by any means. I'm kind of like a baby PhD, just you know, four years out. Um, but um, I'd like to share with you sort of like what I've done and what I hope for in the future. So I have like a really rather diverse training in sustainable agriculture, landscape architecture, and the quantitative and qualitative um, social sciences, all of which really kind of come to bear in my work as an agroecologist. So an agroecologist, I'm interested in exploring ways of applying um, ecological principles to food systems to make those food systems more sustainable, resilient, and equitable. Um, we as agroecologists like basically draw on two sources of inspiration in our, for our work and our research, um, both natural ecosystems and the agroecosystems of traditional farmers and gardeners, um, typically in the developing world. Um, so as an, an agroecologist might ask, how can we make a cornfield in the Midwest, for instance, um, more like the prairie that it replaced? Or how can we make a New England orchard um, more like a milpa, which is a traditional form of agroforestry in Central America? Um, one obvious difference is that the prairie and the milpa um, are much more biodiverse, and that biodiversity really enhances the resilience of those systems. Um, consequently, I've been particularly interested in the connection between cultural diversity and agrobiodiversity, or the diversity of food crops um, in, in urban gardens and farms. Um, so as a new PhD student in 2010, I knew I wanted to study agroecology, and I knew I wanted to to um, study urban agriculture. And I fairly quickly realized that I didn't really need to travel to a foreign country um, to actually study traditional locally adapted agroecosystems or locally adapted agroecological knowledge, that it was just like 125 miles to the north um, in Chicago um, in the backyards and vacant lots of the city. Um, so my refers, first research project, which was published in 2012 in Landscape and Urban Planning, um, I began to uncover the hidden, or at least hidden to me um, and to many others, food producing uh, gardens of Chicago by scanning high resolution images of the city in Google Earth. You know, I was a lonely PhD student. I had nothing better to do. So I sat in a room for apparently 400 hours, I told an, an interviewer um, once, like scanning images of the city and peeking in people's backyards. And I've always been interested in like vernacular landscapes, like what people do on their own with, you know, the material and discursive resources like at hand. Um, and I've always kind of been interested in what kind of happens at the margins too, basically outside the vision of like sort of dominant discourses and structures of urban agriculture. So I found like, you know, um, gardens across the city um, in the backyards of uh, multifamily dwellings in Chinatown and also adjoining Bridgeport and in the backyards of bungalows on the northwest side and in vacant lots on the south and west sides of the city. And also in these sort of like leftover space, spaces, these interstitial spaces between different land uses, like these large gardens in a railroad corridor um, right of way on the south side of the city. So I documented almost 5,000 home gardens, community gardens, farms, and school gardens. And what really kind of like struck me most about um, this was the fact that the aggregate area of the home gardens um, was almost three times that of the community gardens. And you know, community gardens really had, at least up until that point, been um, the focus of uh, much of the scholarship, um, NGO advocacy, and policy making on urban agriculture. It seems like these sort of um, dominant discourses or structures of urban agriculture were kind of like indifferent to home gardens um, and their contributions to urban social ecological systems. You know, maybe because of gender bias um, to some extent, you know, because of their close association with the home, you know, the traditional domain of women. Some women, people may think they're trivial. Um, and it's certainly an attitude that I've encountered in my research, certainly like, you know, with men um, with talking about my research. So I noticed a pattern in the distribution of the gardens when I merged my um, Google Earth data in a geographic information system with sociodemographic data from the U.S. Census. Um, Chinatown and Bridgeport, which we can see right here, um, 
which have large Chinese origin populations, um, were kind of like backyard garden hot spots. People were gardening at really high um, rates in, in this area. And that was something that like, really wasn't talked about in the um, sort of um, circles in which I traveled in urban agriculture um, with advocates for urban agriculture. They weren't really, um, these individuals weren't really engaged in um, the, the discussion about urban agriculture in the city. Um, and, I oh, and I found that vacant lot gardens, um, on the other hand, were most prevalent on the south and west sides of the city in neighborhoods which are mostly African American um, and are often characterized by disinvestment, poverty, and limited food access. So I followed up on this first project um, with a mixed method study. And by mixed methods, I mean uh, mixing um, qualitative and quantitative methods from the social and the um, natural sciences um, of the gardens of Chinese origin, African American, and Mexican origin households on the south and west sides. Um, and um, I, I selected like purposive um, samples of gardens um, um, as part of my study. Um, I focused on African American gardeners because African Americans make up one third of the city and, um, and um, experience higher rates of poverty and um, low food access and food insecurity than other groups um, in the city. Mexican origin um, gardeners because um, um, Latinos make up like one third of the population of Chicago also um, and Mexican origin. Um, uh, residents uh, constitute the, like the largest sort of like nationality in the city. And then Chinese origin gardeners because of like what I found in Chinatown and Bridgeport, like in terms of their gardening at really high rates and having what looked like really unique um, gardening practices too. And plus I'm a plant geek and I really kind of wanted to like see what people were growing in their gardens and um, whether there were any unique or different crops. And so I worked on this project <coughs> Excuse me, excuse me, primarily with bilingual University of Illinois students, um, including, um, as you can see here, Zasu Bermudez, Anna Zhang, Michelle Chan, and Adriano Rodriguez, um, who were insiders in Ch Chicago's Chinese origin or Mexican origin communities. Um, we collected the life histories of gardeners, um, interviewing them about their gardening practices, the garden history, their history of gardening, and kind of like delving a bit into their personal and family backgrounds. Um, I interviewed the African American gardeners, and um, you know, over the course of multiple interviews, developed well not necessarily personal relationships with uh, most of the gardeners, but um, something um, a little bit warmer um, than the typical sort of researcher subject relationship. I th at least I thought. Um, we also inventoried food crops and ornamental species and um, sampled soils for nutrient and lead testing and used hemispherical um, image analysis to analyze the light environment because light can be a real limitation. So I learned a lot from these gardeners um, about how they gardened and why they gardened um, and the role of their gardens and their families and communities. Um, Chinese origin gardeners grew plants in what I call an annual layered polyculture uh, or vertically stacked groups of plants of two or more um, crops um, to maximize and diversify production. Um, gardeners were kind of like resourceful bricoleurs. Um, they took like um, cast off materials and um, constructed these amazing trellises out of them and on these trellises, they grew vining cucurbits, like um, fruiting crops, like bitter melon. And then, then on the ground layer, they grew um, leafy crops that didn't require as much light. And so this was the kind of agroecological practice I was looking for um, to serve as inspiration for um, later research. Um, all of the gardeners shared vegetables from their gardens with friends, family, and, and sometimes strangers who would just pass by. Um, but this was particularly true for African American gardeners, for whom sharing food from the garden may represent a continuation of Southern traditions of sharing um, and community care in the face of marginalization and discrimination. Um, gardeners also repro reproduce in their backyards the vernacular landscapes associated with their places of origin, such as the patio gardens of Mexico. Um, and I was really struck by how some gardeners with very, very limited financial resources still like, were able to construct um, really expressive and productive gardens by drawing on their social ties to other gardeners in the community um, and just their own like, sort of like resourcefulness. Um, and of course, I was impressed by the agrobiodiversity of these gardens and the role that the agrobiodiversity played in the reproduction of traditional um, and novel food ways in households. Um, uh, and I was like really thrilled to find plant species that I didn't know in a home garden in a backyard in Chicago. And in fact, one of the plants that I um, 
found um, or identified in the backyard of a garden, according to the expert on the genus, had never been documented in the United States or Canada. And there was like just an, someone, you know, a Mexican immigrant had brought it to Chicago and was growing it in their backyard, um, which was kind of amazing. I mean, this is that plant, Pichueca, like it's called the Tomatoes, the genus. Um, and then the Chinese origin gardeners were particularly, uh, in particular, were growing uh, uh, culturally important crops um, from seeds that they'd originally sourced from China. So there were a few um, positive, uh, well, a number of positive outcomes um, from this study. It kind of really raised the visibility of home gardens in the city and their contribution to local food systems um, at the household and the community level. Um, and particularly those of diverse communities, um, such as the Chinese origin community in Chinatown and in Bridgeport also. Um, and then Univision interviewed me about the study because um, according to the interviewer, they were always eager to um, highlight um, research or um, to run articles that showed um, Mexican immigrants in a, in a positive light. Um, and so this is, uh, sort of observational research uh, was, of, of course, limited duration. And it wasn't participatory because just, um, my uh, advisor sort of like um, discouraged um, a participatory approach because she knew I wasn't getting any younger and I needed to get my PhD. <laughs> and, and she was also pre-tenure, so I certainly empathize with her now. And so she wanted me to write some papers and finish my research. And I wanted to get the hell out of Champaign-Urbana. So, <laughs> um, so, so um, I had to wait, like I'm doing more experimental research and more um, sort of participatory research, which is what I'm sort of working on here at the University of Rhode Island. Um, first of all, I'm looking at these layered annual polycultures, kind of got cut off there, um, and evaluating whether um, these plants, when grown in polyculture, in mixtures, um, actually yield more than the monocultures themselves. Um, so down here at the agronomy farm, I'm looking at whether amaranth and bitter melon in polyculture and sweet potato and bitter melon in polyculture yield more than the monocultures. Um, and now because of the winds and the rain, all of my like trellises are starting to <laughs> lean over and a couple of them collapsed, but I'm through collecting data. Um, <laughs> And so this is just an image of those from last year. And then this year there were some improvements um, and just yielding a whole bunch of, of bitter melon. And I've been like sharing those with um, people here on campus. Um, also like the grad students, um, a number from India um, and also China um, who've been like, you know, other people are like, oh, bitter melon. And they're like, yes, we want bitter melon. We love it. Um, I'm also doing a variety trial of 15 different bitter melon varieties. Um, and I'm just kind of like interested in bitter melon. I don't have a taste for it, but horticulturally, and I think it's like just a really cool plant and the variety that it comes in. Um, and I'm like done like a channel 10, like local TV spot on bitter melon, big nerd. And, you know, I'm also consulting with some Lao and Cambodian, I didn't at the beginning of these studies, but consulting with some Lao and Cambodian uh, uh, gardeners and other gardeners in Providence um, through the Southside Community Land Trust. And uh, starting to get their input um, and learn what their preferences, preferences are for bitter melon. Um, and so the last couple of years I've also, as part of my sort of like reaching out to the community, have provided seedlings to people who've been interested in the different varieties that I'm growing um, uh, so that they can give me some feedback. And I uh, continue to do observational research in gardens in uh, Providence and finding like weird things like this cucurbit and a Lao gardener's um, plot, which I haven't really identified yet and haven't really um, tried too hard yet. And then like things like this ivy gourd also growing in the um, plot of a Lao gardener, which I'd never seen before. I thought it was like peppers at first, hot peppers, but it's, it's, it's a cucurbit, it's in the cucumber family. Um, so moving forward, I'd really like to do more participatory research to engage um, gardeners and farmers, really kind of from diverse communities, really at the beginning of the research to get their input on um, how to plan the research, um, what their needs are, um, and how the projects and design projects that can address their needs. I'm not really interested in commercializing, for instance, um, um, the so-called ethnic vegetable production. Um, I want to kind of like help the people um, who eat the vegetables, um, grow them more sustainably and productively. Um, and um, maybe even like getting um, people to, um, you know, host like on farm or on garden like variety trials and such so that they're actually um, evaluating um, suggested practices under real world conditions instead of the conditions down at the agronomy farm. So thanks. <laughs>